after the first round of debates, he challenged her, how can you call Hillary Clinton a liar? What did she lie about? And our next speaker uh, educated him on a number of points before we had even more evidence of Hillary's en endless parade of lies. She has been, prior to that and since then, a relentless fact checker of Mrs. Clinton, and I suspect we might hear a few more tidbits on that today, setting the record straight. And in my opinion, she put in two of the most commanding debate performances I have ever seen. If things had been a bit different in an alternate universe somewhere, she might be preparing today to go head to head with Tim Kaine to skewer the Obama-Clinton record. Instead, she will share some thoughts with us. Please join me in welcoming that face, the beautiful, talented Carly Fiorina. Thank you guys so much. I've never been introduced as that face before. That's a new one. You know, <clears throat> I am delighted to be back, delighted to be with all of you. I have to tell you the truth. How many of you are House of Cards watchers or fans? Okay. Well, I have to tell the truth. I was a big fan, sort of an addict actually, for season one, two, and three. I was a binge watcher, for sure. And then I turned on season four. And it just got a little wild for me. I thought, no, I mean, this is ridiculous. I can't watch, and I turned it off. I didn't make it even halfway. I've been told that was a mistake. Now, why do I bring this up? Because the other day, while I was watching the Democratic Convention, and I'm reading, as all of you are listening, to the Russians have hacked into the DNC, Debbie Wasserman Schultz is resigning. I'm thinking, you know, if this were a season or an episode of House of Cards, we wouldn't believe it. We would just think it was too out there. We would turn off the set. And that sort of got me thinking. You know, <clears throat> let's think about House of Cards for a moment. The protagonist, the hero, the main character, let's say is a Democrat politician who has spent their entire life in pursuit of a single ambition to become the President of the United States. They have put their marriage in the service of this ambition. The spouse of the protagonist runs a charity, an initiative, you might say, that has various conflicts of interest with the protagonist. You know, when I started reading articles about meetings on the tarmac between the spouse and the head of DOJ, or how Hillary forgot yet another slate of work-related emails, or how the FBI actually recommended an investigation into the Clinton Global Initiative and DOJ said no, or the curious connections between Ukrainian money and Russian money and the Clinton Global Initiative, or the so many things that the Clintons have gotten away with without any consequence, certainly any investigation, I actually came to a different conclusion. I think we're living in a season of House of Cards. <laughs> I think we're living in a season of House of Cards. Now, you know, there are lots of things that make me mad about Hillary Clinton. But the thing that makes me maddest of all is when she talks to us all about being a feminist. It is not feminism to tell others how to think. It is not feminism to tell others how to vote. It is most definitely not feminism to say anything, do anything, sacrifice everything in the service of your ambition. It is not feminism to trade on your husband's name and fame and charisma as you climb the political ladder. No, that is not feminism. It is ambition and opportunism, not feminism. Here's what I think a feminist is. I think a feminist is any woman 
who uses all of her God-given gifts and lives the life she chooses, whatever that life is. She may choose to run for office, she may choose to be a CEO, she may choose to have five children and homeschool them. A feminist is someone who uses their God-given gifts and lives the life she chooses. And I am offended, frankly, when Hillary Clinton not only says that she is a feminist and any real feminist will vote for her, but that the only way to deal with the real challenges that women face in their lives is some one more huge government program. Mrs. Clinton, I'm a feminist, and I'm not voting for you. Now, you know, we get all hung up in the presidential race, as we should. It's really important who's in the White House makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference to who goes to the Supreme Court. It makes a huge difference to what the agenda is. But of course, there are a whole lot of races that are also important. And so honestly, I'm spending a lot of time helping down ballot candidates. I'm here to support Daryl Glenn and Mike Kaufman and others, the Colorado Party. You have great candidates here. And I'm doing that all across the country. Politics has become a little bit like sports, don't you think? Maybe it's worldwide wrestling, not Wimbledon, but you know, we, we uh, I mean, it's who's up, who's down. Wow, uh, the cable news channels really sound more and more like ESPN, honestly. And we talk about our team, let's be loyal to our team, who's betrayed our team. And all that's good fun. And it's important so that we get our voters out and we, put good conservatives and Republicans in office all up and down the ticket. But as we gather here today as conservatives and Republicans, I'm reminded of something that George Washington said. George Washington warned us about the rise of political parties in his farewell address. His farewell address was given in September, next month. And he said that the danger in the rise of political parties is that we will become so concentrated, so focused on winning that we will forget about governing, that we'll forget about actually who we are and what we believe and what we're trying to achieve. There is much at stake in this election, the prosperity of our nation, the security of our nation, and as I said on more than one debate, I also think the character of our nation is at stake as well. And so what I'd like to do today is maybe pick our heads up just a little, raise our sights just a little off the back and forth and the to and fro and the intensity of an election that is now less than 100 days away, and help us remember who we are as conservatives as Republicans, as citizens, as citizens of this great nation. You know, when I ran for president, I said on many, many occasions, citizens, it is time to take our country back. And what I meant by that is that as a citizen government, that is what we were intended to be, a citizen government of, by, and for the people that as citizens, we cannot simply leave politics to the politicians. We cannot simply believe that our citizenship is executed when we pull the lever. We have to be actively engaged in rebuilding our republic and salvaging the character of our republic. We, as citizens, have an incredible stake in this nation. I think sometimes we have to remember and remind ourselves, renew, maybe relearn, what it is to be a citizen government, a self-governing nation. That implies, among other things, that we have to take our responsibilities seriously, and it also means that we must focus our energies as citizens in breaking down the concentrations of power that exist in Washington, D.C. Why? Because those concentrations of power harm a citizen government. You just had a great panel talking about the tax code. Why is the complexity of the tax code such a problem? Because the complexity of the tax code concentrates power and wealth. 
when a tax code is so complicated, then only the big, the powerful, and the wealthy, and the well-connected can figure it out. Why is the regulatory thicket a problem? Because when the regulatory thicket is so impenetrable, then once again, only the big companies, only the powerful people, only the wealthy and the well-connected can navigate their way through it. In other words, complexity favors cronyism. Complexity regulation tax codes that are 76,000 pages long reward the big, the powerful, the wealthy, and the well-connected, and they harm all the rest of us. And those big concentrations of bureaucratic power, they do not lift people up. They hold people down. And those big concentrations of bureaucratic power create incompetence at the least and corruption at the most. You know, I think as we think about citizen government, as we think about what our responsibilities are, it's important to start by thinking about why is it, why is it that this is such an exceptional nation? We say it all the time. We say, this is an exceptional nation. This is a unique nation. And because we are exceptional and unique, we must play a unique and exceptional role in the world. But it's worth thinking about why. I have said many times, it is only in this nation, and I've traveled and lived and worked all over the world, it is only in this nation, I can assure you, that a woman can start out the way I did, typing and filing and answering the phones, for a nine-person real estate firm in the middle of a recession and go on one day to become the chief executive of what we turned into the largest technology company in the world and run for the presidency of the United States. That's only possible here, ladies and gentlemen. And the question is why? Why is that only possible here? I'm going to tell you a story from a long way away. I'm going to tell you the story of 10 women that I met in the slums of New Delhi, India. In January of 2015, I traveled to India. I traveled because I was the chairman of something called Opportunity International. Opportunity International is a Christian-based charity, but it is the largest private microfinance organization in the world. Microfinance is the process of giving very small amounts of money to very poor people and training them and helping them to become entrepreneurs so that they can lift themselves out of poverty. Opportunity International has lent $8 billion, $100 at a time. I traveled to India because I was holding a global board meeting for our board. But at the end of that board meeting, I wanted to go visit with our clients. And so I went into the slums to meet with 10 of our clients, all of whom happened to be women. And as I climbed up a rickety ladder to get to the top of a roof to sit down with these ladies, I was stealing myself, I must tell you, because the circumstances that I saw around me were desperate. Piles of trash, marauding animals, sewage in the street, people piled on top of each other. It was a desperate circumstance. And so I expected to see these women looking desperate. But they did not when I sat down with them. They looked focused and determined and proud of what they had accomplished. They told me about their, the jobs they'd created and the livelihoods that they'd enhanced, how they'd lifted their families. I tell you that story why. We had, of course, done, the wonderful people of Opportunity International had done much more than give them $100. Actually, we had done more than give them tools or training or support. And let's face it, every single one of us needs tools and training and support. Every single one of us needs a helping hand sometimes. I sure have. Every single one of us needs somebody to take a chance on us sometimes. I sure have. But we had done more than do all those things for these women. You see, we'd looked at these women and then we'd said, your life has value. Your life matters. You have God-given gifts. And you can choose to use those gifts to build for yourself a life of dignity and purpose and meaning. 
I could tell you about people I met on the campaign trail. I could tell you about the single mom I met who had the courage to bring her two children into the world. But I did not see that look of focus and determination in her eyes. I saw a look of growing helplessness because while she wanted to move forward in her life, every time she got a chance, the programs of dependence that she was caught up in held her back. I could tell you about vets I have met, proud, strong, fighting men who would come up to me with tears in their eyes and say, I feel powerless. I don't know how to navigate my way through the VA anymore. I don't know how to get the help that I've so richly earned. I could tell you about the eyes of coal miners who just want to work and who do not understand why their own government has taken their job away from them. Or I could tell you about the eyes of the farm workers that I've looked into who can't work anymore because of the Environmental Protection Agency and what they're doing to the water. These men too just want to work. Now why do I tell you those stories? Because I know and you know and we know, as citizens of this great nation, that every life is filled with possibilities. That every life has value. That indeed every human being is gifted by God. We know this. But what makes this nation extraordinary is not that we have gifted people. Folks, there are gifted people all over the world. And there are people all over the world, regardless of the desperation of their circumstances, who are focused on trying to build lives of dignity and purpose and meaning. You see, all of us want that. Each of us get dignity from our work if that work is done well, and we lose our self-respect when we cannot work. Each of us find our purpose in our families, and when families are torn apart, we become adrift. And each of us finds a foundation in our spirituality, and our faith. It is the way human beings are geared to try and live lives of dignity and purpose and meaning. So if that's true of people all over the world, if that's a core of human nature, why is it that more things have been more possible for more people from more places here than anywhere else on earth? Why here? You see, this is what we have to think about as citizens, because this is what we must preserve. And it starts with a recognition that human nature does not change. Our founders knew this. Our founders were, yeah, they were guys who lived a long time ago. And there are people in this nation who say, well, you know, the Constitution, it's this moldering document. It's almost 300 years old. What possible relevance could it have today? And the only relevance it has is if we rewrite it to say what we want it to say. Here's the thing. Our founders were students of history. Actually, so was I. That's why I had to start out as a secretary. Not discouraging to any of you history majors. It can all work out all right. My dad wanted me to go to law school. I tried that. I hated it. I quit after less than a semester. At least I had the presence of mind to get out before the exams. <laughs> but the point is, I too have studied history. And as a student of history, I know this. Human nature does not change. It does not change dependent upon where you are in the world, and it does not change dependent upon where you are in history. Yes, times change. Yes, cultures change. Yes, values change. But human nature stays pretty much the same. And there are two fundamentals of human nature that have never changed. And our founders understood what they were. And they built the Constitution to take those two fundamentals of human nature into account. The first fundamental of human nature that they understood and that we understood and that we must protect and preserve and enhance in this nation is that every individual, regardless of their circumstances, every individual, no matter who they are, where they come from, what they look like, every individual has God-given gifts. Every individual has purpose and value if we will give them the helping hand and the tools and the support and the chance to find and use their God-given gifts. And so our founders wrote a constitution that started with this basic proposition that an individual is possessed with God-given rights and liberties to life, 
to liberty, to pursuit of the happiness. And the thing that our founders said that was incredibly revolutionary, it is actually unique still in all the world. They said that those rights and liberties come from God and cannot be taken away by man or government. But here's the other thing that our founders knew. Our founders knew what you all know. Well, we all know because we've seen it over and over and over and over in our lives. They knew that power concentrated is power abused. Power concentrated is power abused. I don't care whether it's power concentrated into a boardroom or power concentrated in a bureaucracy or power concentrated in a committee cloakroom. Power concentrated is power abused. And so they wrote the Constitution specifically to prevent the concentration of power. That's what the Constitution's all about. How do we prevent the concentration and therefore the abuse of power? It is why the powers of the federal government are enumerated specifically. And it is why the Constitution is very specific, although we have forgotten this long ago, and this is the fight we must fight beyond November. It is why the Constitution is very specific in saying that every power that is not specifically enumerated and given to the federal government doesn't belong to them. It belongs to individuals and communities and states. You see, ladies and gentlemen, I actually think this is what's at stake. I think the character of our nation is at stake. I think the constitution of our nation is at stake. I think our citizen government is at stake. And I think the fight for our citizen government extends way beyond this election, way beyond the next election. It's not that this election isn't critically important, of course it is. And we're all working hard to make sure it comes out the right way. It's just that it won't be this fight won't be finished with one election. Because we've been losing our citizen government, our mooring as a constitutional nation, founded in these two fundamental and unique in all the world principles. Everyone has rights and liberties and gifts that come from God and power concentrated is power abused. To restore that takes a lifetime of work by the citizens of this nation. So, you are warriors in that fight, or you wouldn't be here. And so I want to close by reminding you, in maybe a different way, about who we are. Think about Lady Liberty. I think about Lady Liberty a lot, because she's such a powerful symbol of our democracy. But I think it's worth thinking about her specifically. What does she look like? She's tall and strong. That is the way America must always be. We must be tall and strong. And there are very specific policies that come as a result of that recognition that we must always stand tall and strong. We have to support and honor our veterans always. We have to invest in our military always. And because we are a unique nation on earth, we do indeed have unique responsibilities. Lady Liberty is also clear-eyed and resolute. She's not shielding her eyes. She's not turning away. This is a nation that must be able to call evil by its name. And this is a nation also that must be prepared to defeat evil when necessary. She is resolute, as we must be in all the great fights that face us now, whether it's against ISIS or longer term and in a less of a hot war, China, or some of our other adversaries, Iran, Russia, North Korea. And she also holds her torch up very high because she knows she's a beacon of hope. She is a beacon of hope in a very troubled and tragic world. This nation must always stand as a beacon of hope because when we lose our character and that which makes us unique, the world is a less 
glorious place. Lady Justice is another person I think a lot about, a symbol I think a lot about. Lady Justice holds a sword by her side. We have to be warriors like she is. We have to be warriors for the values and the principles that have made this nation great. Because if you do not fight for values and principles and foundation and character, they bleed away. She holds a scale in her other hand. And I think that scale reminds us that the bedrock of this nation is all of us are equal in the eyes of God. And so all of us must be equal in the eyes of the law and government, powerful and powerless alike. And she wears a blindfold. And with that blindfold, I think she reminds us, it doesn't matter what you look like. And it doesn't matter who you are. And it doesn't matter where you come from. Because here in America, every citizen has God-given gifts. And everyone has the right, the opportunity, to use their God-given gifts and build a life of dignity and purpose and meaning. I will close with this thought. I said that George Washington warned us about the rise of political parties. Abraham Lincoln founded the Republican Party. Abraham Lincoln waged a war over character and principle. He waged a war that was incredibly damaging to his nation. He waged a war that harmed the economic prospects of this nation for quite a long time, but he waged that war over a moral purpose that a nation as great as the United States of America cannot have slaves, that we must all be equal because we are equal in the eyes of God. And he waged that war over a principle that we are these United States. Abraham Lincoln's most famous address, of course, came on a blood-soaked battlefield at Gettysburg. And there he begged his fellow countrymen and women to fight so that a government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. Ladies and gentlemen, that is our fight, to restore a citizen government to this, the greatest nation the world has ever known. Thank you so much, and God bless you. Follow that with a football. Is anybody want? Is this the wrong crowd? Nobody wants a football. Nobody likes.